I invite you to open God's word with me to Psalm 139. As we open the word of God today, we are talking about some difficult topics maybe to stomach. I, I'm not sure. Sometimes this, this has kind of hit me in, in different ways this week as I've, I've wrestled with the text and what God is trying to say. We're going to talk about the topics of, of control. And when I say control, I talk about needing to be in control, always wanting to be in control, kind of taking control, whether it's of yourself, you know, where you are always you know, stone-faced and whatever, or whether you feel the need to control other people. We're also going to talk about anxiety. Anxiety. And, and the, the root of those things is often the same in our lives. And I, I know, as, as, as I just say this, I know that when, when we start talking about things like this, there are a number of different reactions. And I just want to recognize that really quick. There's a lot of different reactions that take place in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, and, and those reactions differ depending on where we are in our struggle with this. For some people, it may be, for some of you, it may be that, that instantly already you have walls that are going up around you. You can feel that. You can feel that. You're, you are tuning out because you know that this is something that you deal with every single day. You know that you have some sort of problem with this or something, and, and you don't want to let go of that. That you're, you're comfortable there. It's familiar. And, and, and whether... whether or not it has to do with you, or whether it has to do with others around you, just recognizing that we're talking about that gives you some anxiety. For others, the fact that I just said the word anxiety has already got your heart racing. You're like, oh man, we're talking about anxiety today. Oh my goodness. You, you struggle with this. Whether it's publicly or privately, you struggle with this, and it's going on in your head, it's going on in your heart, and, and it can be crippling. It can be a very real, paralyzing thing in your life. We're not talking about like, the kind of caring for others' needs worry. We're talking about that, that, that deep, crippling fear, anxiety, worry that, that makes you not even be able to make a decision. You just don't know what to do. <laughs> for others of us, and I may be included in this one a little bit too, you... You're actually relieved that we're talking about this morning because you got this one nailed. You are on this. You're like, I don't do that. I don't try to control people and I don't try to control myself. I just let things go. I let them brush off my shoulder. I don't have any anxiety in the world. But man, I am so glad that so-and-so is here today. Or I wish that those five people from my office were here. My boss, I wish he was here today because he or she needs to hear this. Yeah, I'm kind of there. I like to think that, that I, have, I have this one nailed. There's a danger here, though. Because we all come with some preconceived notion about anxiety and control issues. We all think that we know exactly what we need or what the other person needs. We, we think we know what three or four steps they need to just get out of this. We have our own ideas about things and that's dangerous because the danger is that we then tune out. And especially for anyone in that third group where you think you got this one nailed, you're like, well, good, I don't have to listen to the sermon today. Nap time. Yeah, okay. I've been there. You've been there. We all have done it before. It's like, ah, good, I got this one. I don't need this. There's a danger, Right? And so I want to encourage you, whatever your reaction is to this topic, I, I want to encourage you to fight that a little bit. Unless your reaction is that you want to hear more. Don't fight that. Fight the reaction to push away. And open your eyes, open your ears, listen for what the Spirit is saying through God's Word today. Because this is, this is stuff that we all deal with, whether we want to admit it or not. And I think God's word has a lot to say about us and about him and his place in our lives during this. So with that in mind, let's pray and ask for God's help because we know that we need it. Lord, we come to you today. As we open your word, we ask that your spirit would move through this place. Speak, Lord. 
and help us to be ready to listen. Lord, help us to hear your voice, that still small voice in our lives. As you invite us in, as you invite us closer, as you work through us, through your Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, God, our rock and our redeemer. And since his name we pray, amen. Psalm 139. Listen for the word of the Lord. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my, my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of, eagle, of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts, God. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you? Lord, I and abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred in them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God. And know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So talking about control issues. Talking about anxiety difficult. It's delicate. B because we first have to recognize that, that there are actually problems that we all deal with. Things that we struggle with in our daily lives. Each of us may struggle with them differently, on, on different levels, to different effects, but we all struggle with them. And, and we don't like to hear that we have struggles. We don't like to hear that we have problems. We don't like to be told that there are things that are in our lives that we still are are working on that God is still working on, that God wants to bring up things that we still need to lay before the throne to submit to him. It can sound condemning. Frankly, it can, it can feel condemning. And, and, and no one likes to be condemned. I mean, you take a, a straw poll here. How many people like to feel condemned? No one. And, and so it's delicate. When we start to think about these things, it's a, it's a delicate thing. But I think another reason that, that we struggle with this kind of a topic is because Scripture has a lot to say and we know that Scripture has a lot to say and all of what Scripture has to say directs us back to one point. Trust in God. And, and really, I mean really honestly, I could stand up here today for the next two hours and read passages to you that say all you got to do is trust God. 
All you got to do is trust God. God's in control. The Lord reigns. He sits on the throne. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your understanding. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries about itself. There are so many Scripture passages that we could go. And, and frankly, actually, as I struggle with this throughout the week, that's actually what I was going to do. I was like, I don't know what to say about this. I struggle with this in my own life. So I, was just, I just made a list of Scripture passages. I was just going to go through them one by one and say, listen, God's got this. God's got this. But it, it feels a little condemning. Why? <laughs> because it reveals something in us that we don't necessarily want to acknowledge. That, that deep down in our hearts, we actually struggle to trust God. We, some, some of us don't even want to trust God. But we don't like to hear that. We don't like to be reminded of that we don't want to lose control. We don't want to lose control of our own life. We don't want to lose control of our own destiny. And in some cases, it actually reveals to us that we, all of us, are totally those people who come to church on Sunday and profess that Jesus is Lord, profess that we trust in God with all of our hearts, and then go home and live like we don't. Live like he isn't. We do this. We all have this nature in us because we all have a sinful nature inside of us. Now, that leads to shame. We feel ashamed because we feel like the hypocrites that Jesus rebukes. We feel like the hypocrites that, that the Bible talks about. We don't want to be that, but we, in some ways, can't help it. Some of us can't help it at all. We, we want to trust in God. We... we desire so desperately to trust God with the different things of our lives, but we can't get out of that cycle of anxiety. That, that cycle that just spins around, and, and some of you know what I'm talking about with this. It just spins around in your head, and you can't get out of it no matter how hard you try. You can't help it. it, it and and it, what it does is it, force, it forces us to act and react in ways contrary to what we believe. Some of us don't trust it. We struggle with that trust because somewhere, sometime, some, somewhere in the past, something happened, whether it's an event or a hurt or an injury or something that, that communicated to us somehow that God was unfaithful or untrustworthy. However untrue we want to believe that is, something happened. And, and so we live a life of worry, wondering when that's going to happen again. When is God going to fail me again? Or we react in a different way and take control of our lives so that he can't. And some of us just don't want to. Some of us just don't want to trust God because of some other idols in our lives that we have going on, whether it's pride or self-righteousness or, or legalism or, or whatever, something that we hold up to that says, I know better. I actually think that I know better than God. We would never really attest to that. We would never say that publicly. But it happens and we act like that. I know better. I can do better than God. God, you know, I'm sure, sure, sure. God's got his plans and stuff like that. But I, I know what I need. But in every case, in all of this, how we act, how we react is a direct reflection of how we think about God in our lives. How we, how we see God in our own lives. And you can see, because I can feel the weight in the room right now, you can see how it sounds and feels and looks condemning to talk about this. And you can see what we are easily given to shame because we know that in our heart of hearts, we're guilty of this. And we continue to be guilty of this. We are those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord. And yet, so often, we live our lives like he's not. And that deep in our hearts, there are still things that we need to surrender. Things that we need to lay down at the foot of the cross and give up. And sometimes we just don't want to. But the truth is, all of those things, all of that, is all based on a lie. 
think about this for a second. When you live in anxiety and fear, this is something that Scripture addresses quite clearly. When we live in anxiety and fear, it's the lie that we believe that God is not going to take care of us. God is not going to take care of us. Think about Israel in the wilderness, right? So Israel is enslaved for 400 years, and then there's the the ten plagues, and then they walk through the middle of uh, the sea on dry ground, You know, these are pretty miraculous things. Mind-boggling things, really. And they get into the wilderness. Like the first day, they're like, well, what are we going to eat? Oh, God's not going to take care of us. Oh my goodness. How, what can he possibly do? And and they complain and they moan and they they get on Moses' case. And then God sends them manna and quail and, and takes care of them. Or when they, you know, even after they've wandered in the wilderness, they've received the law and everything, they get to the promised land. This is their inheritance. God has promised them. He has answered every single one of his promises to date. And then they get to the promised land. They send the spies in. The spies are like, whoa, we are not going in there. Those guys are huge. Have you seen it? It's like Shaquille O'Neal except everyone. They're all huge. You know, they're like 10 feet tall. We're like ants compared to them. There's no way we can do this. Like, really, guys? You remember the plague of the firstborn? You remember walking through the ocean? I mean, like, it, there's a, we don't think that, we, we have that lie that God cannot take care of us. Or that he will not take care of us. Think about Abraham, right? God calls Abraham. God calls Abraham and, and he takes him to this land. He says, I'm going to give you this whole land. I'm going to bless you so much that your, your descendants are going to be like, the, the sand on the seashore, and, and then I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And then Abraham, the first thing he does actually is he goes down to Egypt. Well, one of the first things he does, he goes down to Egypt because there's a famine in the land. And when he gets to Egypt, after all of what God has said to him, he's like, <clears throat> Sarah, wife, uh, hey, you're pretty, and they're going to kill me if they see you and find out that we're married. So I don't know that God's going to be able to protect me for this one. So if you just say you're my sister, I'll be okay. You sin and I'll be okay. That sounds like a good plan. It's based on a lie. Based on a lie. A mistrust that God somehow isn't going to or cannot take care of us. Or maybe the best one, the one that we all struggle with on some level. The sin of pride. Wanting to control things. Because it comes from the very original sin. The first one. God shows us. He he creates Adam and Eve and he shows them the tree of life. Says, here you go. This is it. I'm giving you everything that I got. Just don't eat from this tree. Because then you'll die. And what does the enemy say? What does the serpent say? It's, oh, you're not going to die. Did God really say that? God's actually worried because then you'll find out that you're actually God's too. And you'll be just like him. And you'll be able to control your own destiny. Just take this little bit of fruit. Just eat it. And so they do. And we've been struggling with it ever since. Because deep down, we want to be God too. We want to be in control. We want to to have everything American culture tells us that we can if we work hard enough. You know, that's, that's what we want. And so we struggle with this. But it's all based on a lie. It's all based on the lie of the enemy who does not want us to grow deeper into our relationship with God, who does not want us to continue on that path of sanctification. And this, like everything else we've talked about this summer, is intimate related to who we are in Christ. We are called. We are God's people. God draws us in. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. He wants us to be made more in the image of Christ. He wants to bless us. So why this passage today? Why, what does this passage have to do with control or anxiety or pride or anything? Because this passage is truth. Spoken on every level of not just these particular sins and things that we struggle with, but everything that we struggle with. Because the reality is, is that God knows, knows us deeper than we know ourselves. What does Scripture say? 
all of the days were ordained for me in your book before even one of them came to be. You saw my unformed body. God knows us so deeply and so completely that even before we came to be, He called us to be His own. He loved us that much that before a single cell of your body was even a reality, Christ died for you. The reality of Scripture is that the reality of God's Word, of God's love, is that no matter where you are in this, in this cycle of, of sin, whether, whatever it is that you're dealing with in your lives, God wants to redeem that. God wants to redeem you. He wants to continue to save you, to sanctify you, to make you more and more like Christ. This is part of who you are in Him. It's interesting that David wrote this psalm. David is like the, the picture of all that we're talking about here. So, he's the youngest. And all you youngest kids out there know what that means. Um, I don't. I'm the oldest. I just know what the, my younger brother got all the time. Um, <laughs> might be something I need to give up some point in time. Uh, no, he was the youngest. And in that culture, that meant he wasn't really worthy of anything. Uh, he, he was the, the sheep herder guy that lived out in the field and, and watched over the flock for the family so the other guys could do the important stuff. And God called him. God anointed him to be king of Israel. And God set his family on an eternal trajectory that leads to Jesus Christ, that, le that led to Jesus Christ and to the redemption of the entire world. His family would always and will always be on the throne. And yet, David lived in caves because people were chasing him and wanted to kill him. David committed adultery, committed murder in like the same instance. David was betrayed by his own family, driven out of his own house. David was barred from building God's temple. And we see him hashing this out all throughout the Psalms, wondering, what in the world, God? What is going on? And yet in one of the last psalms that we have of his, we have this admittance and this kind of call and response from God. Yeah, I recognize that I've done some stupid stuff, but God, you have searched me and you know me. You know every thought, every word on my tongue before it is even formed. And you continue to call me. You continue to work in my life. You have never ever said once, sorry you're too far gone. Sorry, I don't think, I, you've struggled with this for too long and you haven't given this up. Sorry. But I don't think I can help you. God says, no. I knew about all of what you're going through before you even knew anything. And whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whether it's anxiety, whether it's control, whether it's addiction, whatever it is that you are struggling with, God says, yeah, I knew about that. And I still love you. And I still call you. And then David says, okay, God, search me. Know me. Know my anxious thoughts. Know, find out if there's any way in me that is undesirable. And then what? Lead me in the way everlasting. Wherever you're at, wherever you find yourself, wherever this scripture hits you this morning, God says, you're still mine. I still love you. I still want to work with you. I still want to help you. I still want to redeem those things. I want you to lay them down. I want you to be free from them. I want to lead you in the way everlasting. This psalm is, a, is, is the Father reminding us of who He is and who we are.
So it's not practical advice. I'm not giving you a three-step program about how you can get out of anxiety or how you can stop being a control freak. I, I, don't, I don't know that this is the place for that, <laughs> to be honest with you. But what, what Scripture does tell us and continually tells us over and over and over again, what God's voice continually tells us over and over again is, hey, I know that you're imperfect and it's okay. What is it that we can do to move a little bit forward? What is one thing this week that, that we could lay down before the throne? What is one step we could take to maybe giving up some of those things that are deep-seated in our hearts that we don't want to give up, that deep down we really actually like? Because it makes us feel more like God. What is one step that we can take so that God can lead us in the way everlasting to redeem us, to sanctify us, that we can live into the identity that we claim as we come here to worship each Sunday. What's one step? I don't know what it is for you. I don't. But you do. And God does. And so we're going to take a moment here and just be silent. We're going to respond to a different psalm, the words of a different psalm that says, be still. And know that I am God. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted in the heavens. I will be exalted in the earth. And I want to lead you in the way everlasting. What is it that the Spirit is tugging on your heart today? Let's just take a minute to listen. Take a minute to hear what God is telling us. And then take an opportunity to lay that down at the foot of the cross. Taking just one step. You don't have to lay it all down. It's an ongoing thing. It will be forever. Scripture says, He who began a good work in you will see it through to completion in the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, in this moment, uh, we know that you meet us wherever we are. Whether we have walls all around us or whether we are cut to the core, that you meet us there, not condemning, always loving, always receiving always calling us back. And so God, we ask that in this moment, you would speak to us. Lord, draw out of us what it is that you're calling us to right now. Lord, in the same way that you were not done with Abraham, you were not done with Israel, you were not done with David, you are not done with us. You continually call us to yourself. Calling us to a deeper, deeper relationship in you. Living into the identity that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your mercy your abundant mercy, which is new every morning. And we ask that, that you would continue to call us into deeper and deeper things. 
Lord, bless us. Continue this good work within us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like the worship team to come forward. Um, so when we talk about things like that, it can be difficult. Um, there can be things that come up, and, and I understand that. If, if you uh, want to talk about this, please know, as is always true, I am available. I'm here a lot, and nobody else is. <laughs> so, uh, and my office door is always open. So I would love to talk to you about this. I'd love to hear about how God is working in your life and how he's drawing things out of you. Those are the, those are the stories that are just so awesome to hear. So if, if that's something that you're kind of feeling like you need to, to hash some things out, please know that you can, you can come and be here and do that. We can do that together and see what God's doing in your life.